So my name is Kate Hollinshead and I am a co-director and the head of education at Equalities. So Equalities is a not-for-profit equality and diversity training and consultancy organisation. We work England-wide in all education settings, right down from, from nurseries up to universities, helping to promote equality and tackle discrimination. And here are just some of the services we provide. I'm going to be talking about some of the challenges that we face in education, for both teachers and young people with regards to equality and diversity, and how we can navigate some of these as well. Okay, so I've been working in the field of equality now for seven years in total. Uh, I've worked with thousands of young people and lots and lots of teachers as well all across the country. And many young people, the majority of young people that I've worked with have never previously had the opportunity to discuss issues of equality and discrimination or have their questions addressed in a structured way in a formal setting okay. and there are lots and lots of reasons for this so certainly in a packed curriculum issues of equality can be seen as peripheral particularly when there is a lack of emphasis from central government okay. and sometimes the link between getting equality right and improvement in young people's behavior and attainment and achievement is not made I mean, people don't see that and see instead that equality is an extra burden, perhaps something that's a peripheral rather than core to education. Okay. So I've often heard teachers of subjects such as chemistry or maths saying that well, promoting equality is not their responsibility, that falls on the PSHE lead or the citizenship lead and that shouldn't be something that, that they have to deal with. And then on the other side of the coin, teachers say in general that actually if they were responding to incidents all the time, to things such as, that's so gay, or don't be such a girl, things that kind of happen quite a lot in, in primary and secondary schools, then they wouldn't have any other time to do anything else. Okay. And that can sometimes be a reason why people decide not to deal with equality and diversity issues in school. So these are just some of the, the barriers that I've already started to talk about, but I'm going to go through a few more of them and see how we can overcome them a little bit later. Sometimes where we don't see incidents happening in schools, where there's perhaps not that explicit over manifestation of sexism or, or racism or homophobia, then we might assume that everything is fixed and inequalities have been removed and everyone is already included. And that's when people fail to look at the structural inequalities that are at play. It can often take that bit of extra work for people to see the barriers that exist for other people when they don't exist for you. And lots of people fall at that hurdle. Okay. There can be this idea that achieving equality is just about ignoring difference and treating everyone the same. And in fact, someone said that to me when I set up the business. Well, I can't see you getting much work because if we just treat everyone the same, we treat everyone nicely, then surely that's equality done. Mm -hmm. So that is a, another barrier. Mm -hmm. This idea that there's a politically correct brigade, the PC brigade, that is sort of telling people what they can and can't say as well, shuts down conversations. People feel like, well, they can't say anything these days. I don't know what's the, what are the right words to use to discuss these topics, so I won't discuss them at all. And even this idea here that equality's gone too far and minorities are getting preferential treatment these days. We've heard that a lot. And of course, many of these myths stem from accurate and damaging newspaper reporting, which undermine the good work that equality and diversity practitioners do. Just thought I'd give you a small snapshot of perhaps what, what we are up against. So here, political correctness goes mad at the nursery the way that whole groups of people are spoken about in such derogatory ways. So a lot of this is not only uh, an influence on teachers and adults' opinions, but certainly on our young people as, as well. Okay. So many of these barriers to engaging with equality and diversity are born out of a lack of training around equality that's available, pressures on teachers' time and resources, and a continually increasing workload and a fear that talking about these issues will open up a can of worms. Hear this as well. Well, if I start asking questions about equality, I'll get so many questions, I'll get so many comments that 
I, I don't know how I'm going to deal with them. I hear that quite often. And teachers can feel trepidation and lacking in confidence and knowledge to broach particularly sensitive and controversial subjects. In research that we conducted in 2011, only 61% of all teachers and only 35% of teachers who had graduated in the last 10 years had received any training at all in issues of tackling racism specifically and promoting equality. And those that had thought the training was quite cursory and it hadn't really equipped them to practically deal with issues in the classroom. And of course, in the last few years, the issues to deal with have become more and more difficult, especially to do those in an effective and cohesive way. So the election of Donald Trump, the Brexit vote, the conflict in Syria, the refugee crisis, the number of terrorist attacks that have occurred in the UK and overseas, overseas are just a few of the issues that are having an impact on classroom dynamics and community cohesion. The introduction of the statutory duty placed on schools to prevent extremism and the requirement alongside it to promote fundamental British values has caused much concern that communities are going to be stigmatised, alienated or even policed and that important conversations about controversial and sensitive issues have been stifled. And with a lack of guidance around impl implementing these duties, there's been very little from central government about how to practically implement those duties. Mistakes certainly seem to have been made and we're seeing the effects of those in schools where people have been reported for extremism or for fears that they're going that someone's going to be radicalised and actually that's been found not to be the case at all and that's damaged the pupil and the parents' relationships with the school. This is happening. So teachers need advice and guidance on how to navigate these duties in a way that allows pupils to flourish and feel safe and included and to open up the debate rather than shutting it down. Okay. There can be a widespread fear that simply by talking about issues and raising awareness of controversial and sensitive issues, they might somehow create problems out of nowhere and that by ignoring issues they'll just disappear. And left alone, young people will be naturally immune to prejudice. However, our young people do not exist in a bubble. They are just as receptive to the messages of the media and all of these other influences as adults are. Perhaps not using the, the more traditional formats as much anymore, but the rise of social media platforms. And at this point, I thought I'd just share with you some of the young people's ideas and questions and concerns from some of our workshops that explore stereotyping and, and critical thinking skills. So if I show you, first of all, I will read a few of them out. When we work with in secondary schools, we often take in this piece of flip chart paper that is blank, all but the description of the person in the middle and ask them to write down anything that they would associate with that person. It can be positive, it can be negative, or anything that they've heard associated with that person. And there's lots on here, and a real mix. You can see dangerous, hoodie-wearing teenager would be dangerous, but they're misjudged. This word chav comes up, they're going to stab you. A bloke, my friends, a real mix of different things. We ask the young people what they're thinking, so then we can pitch the work at their level and dissect some of these ideas. And then this is the similar activity, just with the word immigrants in the middle. And again, a real mix of different things here. Illegal, scared, ruthless, escaping, no visa, donated clothes, escaped countries, foreign. There is a lot in this country. Lots and lots of different ideas, again, that we have here. So a, a real mix of different things, but it is worth finding out what our young people are thinking about. And these are from all different schools across. Before we go into schools, we work with the young people to, 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 again, to find out where they're coming from and what experiences they've had. We distribute a questionnaire, um, and this was one of the responses that really stuck with us and reinforced why we do this work. So every single day someone comments rudely about me and where I am from. Some people make fun of girls' headscarves. I don't wear one, but it's still offensive because it's from my religion and my friends and family wear it. What's the point of coming to school? Sometimes I feel like crying. It's 2016. Grow up and learn respect. Please come in and talk about it. So that's a young people, person really in need of help there. There is a battle. 
on our hands here. There is a battle to fight. How are we going to fight this? So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the things that we can do to, to work our way through these barriers and these challenges that we face. Firstly, we must support our teachers, equipping them with the knowledge, the skills and the confidence to remove any barriers that they have, that they exist, to promoting equality and tackling discrimination in the school. The idea that there is a PC brigade arbitrarily banning words and phrases must be proved as a myth because it really does shut down conversations. So this idea, for example, that you can't sing Bar Bar Black Sheep anymore. I don't know whether anyone's heard that one, but um, it has been so pervasive, this idea that actually we've got nurseries teaching children Bar Bar Green Sheep or Bar Bar Rainbow Sheep, sometimes even multicultural sheep. Good luck with that one. Um, so the word black as a descriptive term, that's what it comes from. You can't say black anymore because it is racist. The word black as a descriptive term is not banned. And this idea of this PC brigade actually trivialises what we're trying to do. The good work that we're putting in place as equality and diversity practitioners and stops people from even talking about issues. And I understand there are often good intentions behind the idea of ignoring difference and treating everyone the same. But this is really problematic. If teachers ignore difference, they might deny pupils the opportunities to be proud of their identity, to talk about their identity, and they may fail to spot when discrimination or exclusion occurs. By treating everyone the same, we're not going to treat people according to their needs, whether they're cultural or linguistic. And in the simplest terms, we may force a wheelchair user to use the stairs because we've not noticed it. Additionally, it is everybody's responsibility to promote equality throughout all of their practice and tackle discrimination whenever it occurs. It is flawed thinking to believe that it's not everyone's responsibility to safeguard pupils against anything that may damage them and their future. And nothing will ever get better if we don't challenge everything, even those incidents that may appear to some people as low level or those that happen continually. In schools where a consistent approach to behaviour is applied, recording and investigating all incidents thoroughly, the number of prejudice-related incidents decreases as pupils understand the consequences of their actions. And as it is teachers' responsibility, collaborative work, not just with other teachers, but with parents and carers in the wider community, can have real benefits. So partnership working with parents or local community or religious groups or organisations set up to tackle inequalities can bolster equality work, bringing additional viewpoints and expertise, highlighting issues that pupils are facing that may not have been considered by school leaders or school teachers. And working with parents in this way can also help bring the more sceptical or, or reticent, concerned parents on board with equality work. I know that's a barrier that often teachers face, that parents do not want their young people taking part in this work. So alongside removing these barriers, teachers must be equipped with the skills to carry out effective conversations with their pupils around equality and diversity issues. So at Equality Teach, we work with teachers to think about approaches such as these on the board and whether they're good practice or inappropriate. I'm not going to give any answers now. I'm going to let me just have a little look at those but certainly some of these ideas of empathizing with a pupil who's expressed prejudice is that good practice is that proceed with caution is that uh, inappropriate when a pupil offers their parents and siblings opinions on an issue what does the teacher do how does the teacher navigate that we also look at tricky scenarios that teachers can find themselves in um, and these are just two that we are finding increasingly prevalent at the moment in lots and lots of schools that young people are coming in saying that they are <coughs> frightened of going places because of terrorism. And this one in particular as well has happened a few times that people feel that immigrants aren't welcome in Britain anymore and worried that immigration officers might come in as well. So how do teachers deal with these things when they, they, they come through their door? Teachers explore how to embed equality into their teaching. So we look at examples like these. Are these appropriate? Are these inappropriate? 
and we discuss terminology as well, which is a real sticking point for many people. And that's discussed in an open environment where people can really get to understand the terms and why some terms are deemed unacceptable. We adopt a whole school approach to promoting equality and tackling discrimination. So we work with everyone in the school, governors, teachers, support staff, admin staff, lunchtime supervisors, because discrimination can happen anywhere. As well as updating policies and procedures in accordance with equality law and setting those equality objectives. So this ensures that we're focusing on structural inequalities that can be embedded within institutions, as well as those individual so I just for the last few minutes really like to just share with you a couple of the activities we deliver with young people. So dinner party is where we ask young people to work in groups, normally in primary school year five and year six pupils, and um, imagine that they're going to host a dinner party. Okay? They don't need to worry about any of the preparation other than who can come to their dinner party. And they have cards with these words written on them, and they have to choose four that can come, and four that can't come, with some reasons why as well. And we've set up that space, safe space, and these are some of the ideas that we get back. So this was from a year five class in Tower Hamlets. Now rather than working with just the eight guests, we worked with 12 guests in the school, so there are some that you may not have seen from a previous slide. But let me just highlight some of the things that have been said. So our footballer could teach you how to play football, so let's invite him, or they could give you money, or we don't really support Chelsea, so we don't want them there. Um, a mathematician could do your homework for you. The man who lost his legs in an accident has had a tough life. He needs a party more than others. But he might have a disease, and he might send you to do his chores for him because he can't do them. Mm -hmm. A black man who grew up in Somalia may be a kidnapper, oh, yes. maybe dangerous. A Muslim from Bradford can't speak English, can start wars, a bit of a stranger, we don't really know that much about them. A woman from Iran, throw bombs around. It's a strange country, Spanish immigrant can't speak English. A woman from Kosovo, and there's enough foreigners in our country. Now this was a particularly difficult year five class, and I don't wish to pe <laughs> paint all year fives as having these attitudes, but I have yet to go into a classroom where there hasn't been a prejudicial study that I've said. So, after we've got all of their ideas out, we do a little reveal that our Chelsea footballer and our Spanish immigrant is the same person, and this is Cesc Fabregas. So we then start to deconstruct their ideas about immigrants. Well, can Cesc Fabregas speak English? We said that all immigrants couldn't. Cesc Fabregas can. Okay, great. Are all immigrants poor? Let's have a look. Well, no, lots of immigrants have got lots of money as well. Okay, so we can start to really deconstruct their ideas. So, our woman who fled from Kosovo as a child, and our singer, songwriter, and actress is Rita Aura. So you can start depicting, uh, unpicking, sorry, their ideas about refugees. Our black man, who grew up in Somalia, who is our kidnapper, our dangerous kidnapper, is Mo Farah. Okay, so we can again talk about ideas around what Somalia is like um, and where people have got those ideas from. And then our man who lost his legs in an accident and the man who climbed Mount Everest is Mark Inglis, the first double amputee ever to climb Mount Everest. And then just to finish off, really, just to show you this um, uh, Facebook post. It may be familiar to you. you. You may have better Facebook friends than I, and it might not be familiar to you. But this is a Britain First post that we deconstruct with secondary school pupils. So um, you can see here the information, British old age pensioner, total uni benefit, £6,000. And then we've got illegal immigrants, refugees living in Britain, total yearly benefit, £29,900. Asking the young people whether they can see any mistakes in this post at all. Um, and often they will point that these two groups, this categorisation of people, very, very different. Would illegal immigrants be getting nearly £30,000 from the government? Why not? 
know, what status do people who are in a country illegally have, what status do refugees have, etc. Providing them with the facts. It's actually an asylum seeker in this country if they're not working will have a total of £1,921.40 a year. Very different to what is suggested on this post. So looking at why this post exists, why they've written things like, have you got the guts to copy and paste this? I just did. What are they trying to persuade you to do? Uh, and the, the damaging nature of posts like this. Because often when we put this on, young people think this is really unfair. Pensioners should be getting more money. And that, that might be a valid point. But it is blamed on illegal immigrants and refugees, the reason why pensioners are not getting off them, okay. So that really is it from me. I hope that's provided some food for thought. There's still many challenges out there, and I think sometimes it can feel like we are fighting against a tide, but it is, it is essential that this fight continues and that we are continually striving for the best for all of our young people. Now, our vision at Equality is of uh, an equal and inclusive, productive society where everyone is valued and able to achieve their full potential. And I'm hoping that together we can make this happen.